Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Collegiate R6. As always, my name is Jay's Wills, and joining me on the desk tonight is Vial. Good to have you here, man. And well, tonight we've got a fantastic doubleheader on our hands. But the first matchup of the night is Kent State versus Kettering University. A great match for sure. We're about to see. We're going to answer some questions here tonight. The one we won't be answering, what is a Kettering? That one's going to remain a mystery. But something we will answer is which of these two teams is the superior Southern Division team in this Open League? And which one can we expect to make a deep run in the Open League playoffs next week? I'm excited for this one. Vial, welcome. Great to be with you, Jay-Z. And honestly, I don't think we can count either of these teams out for a deep run because this is just for bragging rats at this point because both of these teams have a guaranteed spot, which I believe you have mentioned before. And I'm very excited to see which one of these teams is going to push themselves to the max because if we potentially see these teams go on an extremely deep run, maybe they face each other again in the playoffs that could prove to be, you know, something to look back on. If they play each other again, they look back at this match, look at this as another VOD review. What do they want to pull out? Or maybe they throw it away and don't want to play exactly how they played these maps. Well, bragging rights are on the line, but more so than that is the position in the collegiate rankings that have been developed by many members in our community. Right now, Kent State sits at number 20 in the rankings and Kettering remains unranked. Now, this decision was a bit curious. People have questioned this and whether or not Kent State really deserves that position while Kettering sits in the unranked spot, simply because both of these teams are 3-0 undefeated. Both of these teams destroyed everyone in their path to get to this point. 14-3, 14-3, and 14-6 is what Kent State did. And 14-3, 14-7, and 14-4 is what Kettering did. So both of these teams dominated the competition so far. So the victor tonight, will it's going to be a big deal, and it's going to establish one of these teams or the other as the more dominant team. But to see exactly how it's going to play out, we're going to have to take a quick look at our map bands as they begin to roll through. I would not be surprised if we see our usual T3 special in the books for tonight, your clubhouse, your cafe, your Oregon, or something like that. But we're not going to see Cafe, and that's going to be the first ban off the board. Cafe, one of those maps, like you said, it's a T3 special. It's one of those maps that everyone typically likes to go to because everyone knows how to play it, where to play it, and exactly how it falls into their lineup. We're also not going to see Consulate. But one map that we will be seeing is, of course, part of that special. It's going to be Clubhouse, and the next up is Oregon. Two maps that I am personally fond of, especially when we play you know, competitive series. And the last map we are going to, assuming we get there, it's going to be Theme Park. Jay-Z, what do you take of that? Well, Theme Park's always fun to see, especially because we rarely get to see Theme Park actually played. Most teams are not a huge fan of it. And because of that reason, not a lot of teams devote a lot of time to practicing or scrimming this particular map, simply because it's just not enjoyable to play all that much. So Theme Park can often be a dark horse map, one that teams like to pull out of the darkness, really surprising their opponents with. And tonight, if we get to that point, I think it's going to be probably more one-sided than the other two maps we're going to see. Clubhouse and Oregon, usually pretty balanced maps. Everyone knows how to play them. Everyone's got pretty developed strap books for those particular maps. Theme Park is the big question mark that we're going to have to wait to see if we get that far. But I want to talk a little bit about these rosters and particular players to watch. One player immediately comes to mind, and that is Bucca on Kettering University. Bucca has the second highest player rating in all of the Open League right now, a 1.75 rating. A very impressive one, to say the least, not to mention a 2.13 KD to that as well. So crazy numbers Bucca has been putting up all season. I have my eye on Anomaly as well. An excellent player, an excellent caster, and one who is looking to make their presence known here tonight, a 1.5 rating. But on the side of Kent State, I've got my eye on Crusade and Goose. Both of these players, 1.5 rating and a 1.4 rating respectively. They are going to be looking to make their presence known and lead their team to what they hope is a victory and a victory that would solidify their position in the collegiate rankings, solidify them as a team to be reckoned with. Both of these teams want to make that namesake, and I believe both of these teams are ready as we are just about to kick off this fir first map 
of Clubhouse. And boy, oh boy, am I excited. This is where we can see team strategies get thrown out the window here. And it's that operator ban. This is the start of where some teams can play mind games. And what do you expect to see here, Jay-Z? I mean, I would expect to see something in the realm of a either Thatcher, Maverick, or a Habana. Those are your number three, the top three bands you'll see on okay. Clubhouse. And we're not going to see any of that. We're going to see the Yana band. That is pretty shocking to me, I got to say. But maybe it's a target band trying to, to catch out a player who likes to use Yana in their lineup. But a very unique band to say the least. Our second band, the next attacker that's gonna go off the board, that is going to be the Zero. Okay, Vial, personally, I have no idea what is going on. I... I don't know, I, I'm at a loss for words. I think they're trying to throw a wrench in for both of these teams. I really have nothing else to say other than maybe Yana was a target band, but I really don't know about zero considering i believe he's still in a quarantine phase but this ban now this actually makes sense maestro off the board th that's one of those operators that you really don't want to deal with especially when it comes into the later round when he has that 81 bullet singer and malusi falls off the board another extremely powerful operator gone yeah, uh, I'll make one clar clar clarification. Zero is in fact playable with the release of the new patch, Neon Dawn. Both uh, Echo and Zero were released from their respective, quote, quarantine periods in competitive play. So now they are very viable operators and very heavy information operators that can be brought to the table. And that's definitely why we're going to see that Zero ban denying the attackers as much information as possible. And it seems like that was the theme of all of these bans. Maybe the Malusi, not so much. But for the Maestro, the Zero, and the Yana, all three operators are heavy information operators. Getting your team as much information as possible to both assist your attack and assist your defense and deny some plants at the same time with those evil eyes. So we're not going to see any of those information heavy operators in play, but we will see the tertiary bomb site of Jim and Bedroom, our first bomb site of the night here on Clubhouse with Kettering starting on defense. Well, that makes me wonder then, is it really a tertiary bomb site considering they picked it first? They must have something up their sleeve if they really want to play this site, or they must just feel extremely comfortable, and it makes a lot of sense. Certain teams feel comfortable, or rather more comfortable, on other maps and certain sites, just like they would on other maps and other sites. So maybe Kettering has something up their sleeve, an ace in the pocket that they elect to bring out here, but right now it just looks like a standard hold. Yeah, we're gonna get this standard gym bedroom hold going on. You're gonna have a little bit of that cash extension as well as a roamer downstairs. That's going to be the Jaeger. That's Papa on the lurk. The cash extension is gonna be a point of focus on this round. And what can make or break a good attack on gym is how efficiently you can deal with the cash extension and if you can survive the pressure that is going to be applied from that side. In combination with some castle barricades that Bucca is bringing to the table, it can be very challenging to work your way in from construction and get that pressure mounting from the eastern side. That is simply how you establish that 180 degree crossfire on gym and bedroom once you get this jacuzzi wall open. And something we actually haven't talked about much yet is the fact that Thatcher is very much on the table and that is going to deny both the mute jam and the Electro Claw from stopping the exothermic charge. So now the Jacuzzi wall is wide open and with only a minute burned into the round, the attackers here have made some pretty good progress. Attack it's very rare that we bomb. see Thatcher on the board for any team and any map. So the fact that he is, it's going to bring a lot less versatility to a defense. You know those walls are going to get open very quickly and very effectively. So sometimes I even question bringing in a wall denial like a Kaid because sometimes He's not as effective as, say, a Mute, who also brings a Nitro Cell, but also brings a better shotgun. And speaking of better shots, Derp gets that first frag on the board for Kettering. He's going to open this series wide open. 
Well, starting it off in style, that's what Kettering is up to, but IRX has the answer, and with the 556, we'll take the head of Snappy. So that's the Kaid off the board, and now with one minute to go, this attack has now continuing to mount that pressure, but they need to get this pressure mounting onto the site itself. Uh, Goose will be the player elected to pressure from this CCTV and cash side. The Nitro Cell rains on through, but will not deliver any fatal blow. Derp. Still holding tight on this green box, hoping to stall out this push. But all alone is the Nomad, and so the push from the gym is the next step in this attack. But there's one player to defend that, and that is Bucka, lurking carefully as the castle, hiding behind this wall. Actually snuck all the way up into gym, but Derp will take the shots and find the head of Goose. Bucka finds another, though, and that's going to be IRX to drop. And now it's two versus four with 20 seconds to go. Crusade has to find something here, an opening, so that way so he can get back on into sight. He believe he saws the head just by those dumbbells, but no, his head is actually going to get cleanly taken off by Anomaly. And all 1v4 with low HP here for Snooki. Not going to be able to land it as the SMG-11 rings true once again for Anomaly. And Kettering, they land their first round in what looks to be a long map. Well, a brilliant first defense, especially on the tertiary bombsite. A bold move, to say the least, to head to gym and bedroom first. But winning it sends a message for sure. Now you have uh, KSU on the back foot, no doubt. Now they are the ones who now have to find some traction on the two harder sites to get your attacking pressure mounting. We saw a brilliant gym defense, characterized both by brilliant defensive play and a bit of attacking struggles from the side of Kent State. They failed to get a good crossfire going rather than double swinging or getting some really good aggression as a unit. We saw a couple of solo plays, a couple of attempts to push into sight on their own, and as a result, they took gunfights one at a time, and that is simply not the situation you can be in attacking a team like Kettering, who is a strong defensive team and a very competent roster that can lock down any site that they are presented with. But here in round number two, our focus shifts from Drim over to Church and Arsenal. Definitely more of a viable site. Surprising that we're seeing this one second, but nonetheless, we are gonna see exactly what Kettering tries to do on this setup and what Kent State can do on their attack. Derp actually takes a little bit of early damage. Not exactly sure what that was from. Could have been from an attack that threw. Or from something else, maybe a shotgun blast trying to open up a rotate hole. However, that could play a huge factor here for that attack, especially if they can get an early pick, say, onto Derp or anybody else. That puts them in a huge advantage, especially in terms of health. But I want to talk about this site a little bit more, especially going to it as a secondary bomb site. I personally find this very, very strong, especially if you have a team that can coordinate it extremely well. And you know exactly where everyone wants to play and where these attackers are going to come from. So, personally, I think if you have that all unlocked, you can use this as a primary bomb site. Again, still kind of fascinating that they're wanting to stay away from that cache CCTV bomb site. Because that's typically the bomb site that we see is number one on most teams' lists. It's very rare that you see it as a tertiary bomb site. But clearly, Kettering knows something that we don't. Well, they're hoping to keep this locked down as long as they can, and with this roam clear going down, or at least attempting to go down, and with a minute burn, it's not too bad. This is pretty good progress made, and IRX will now use the exothermic charge to continue that very progress and open up this moto hatch, giving them a line of sight onto the site, but the C4s rain on through the hatch, but they will not land true. Bucka could not connect that one, and now Snooki here will be very aware that there could be a player above, but for now, with that full clear, all five attackers now stacked up in bar, now have to make the decision of where they want to pressure from next. Bringing only one hard breacher on this map, especially when all the others are unbanned, is an interesting choice and it limits you to only two hatches or a hatch and a wall. And that can be very limiting, especially when attacking this basement where so many walls need to be opened wide. Derp gonna open it up and find the head of one, but Goose with the response will take down Derp as well. So keeping it even now in a 4v4, as now a minute rears its ugly head on the clock, this push is gonna have to come through. The problem is here, they don't have a lot of info on where these defenders are, and now that each and every single one of them are on this part of the floor of the bomb site, 
they're susceptible to any of these peaks. And speaking of peaks, it's gonna be the C4. He downs one. That's snappy and catches Goose. Bucket gets one back as well. But there we go. It's now left in a 1v4, and it just doesn't look possible. Kettering on the front foot of this matchup right now. Another brilliant defense from Kettering. A stellar performance characterized by just great anchor play from every single defender. There was a lot of gunfights taken and simply just won by these Kettering anchors. They didn't get too crazy with a roam. They didn't risk losing any players early on. They simply waited for KSU to walk into their open arms and they delivered those kills when the push came through. Another round characterized not only by brilliant defense, but by a little bit of struggling on this attacking side from Kent State. They once again could not determine where they wanted to get that crossfire from, where they wanted to get a pinch onto the site. They funneled through the fatal funnel of main stairs and moto. And as a result, some brilliant play from Papa using some soft destruction in Arsenal shut that down every single time an attacker came on through either of those doorways. So on CCTV and Cat. The revision that Kent State need to make here is they need to work as hard as they can to establish a crossfire on this site. You simply can't walk all in through that CCTV wall and hope that that works for you. You have to get some control of rafters all over on CCTV window. Maybe approach from construction and try to get control of top red. You need to get these 180 degree or at the very least 90 degree crossfires if you want to attack a site like this against a very competent roster. It always makes you wonder what is going on in terms of the IGLing and what is the comms like because we saw, th I believe, all four of them on that bottom floor site, at least in terms of spread out and wanting to go for a pick. But I'll get back to that hopefully in a second as we look to see. It's going to be a fight of bandit tricking and thermite charge here. IRX and Snappy, they're fighting back and forth and there goes the first exothermic charge and snappy's gonna win that one outright and irx he's playing mind games he wants to get that first one he's gonna get it down and there we go that wall is gonna get open snappy's gonna have to fall back the thermite will win that fight well the first fight from the thermite has been won but the next couple fights a couple of gun fights are what is in the cards for irx a goose gonna take a little bit of damage there on that Nomad roll as Derp takes quite a few shots out towards the garage, holding this Rafter's position strong. But without much else going for them, this attack is continuing to struggle as Goose is the next player to hit the floor. Papa delivering that blow. Bucca will find another one. That's going to be Jax, the next player to fall. The Ash off the board. That is a lot of utility that you have lost at this point. And Kent State are once again all on the east side of this building you've got two players on this breach and one player trying to pressure in rafters irx will find derp so that's some traction for this attack that they're desperately going to need here if they're going to want to find this success but one pick is not simply enough you need to get control of rafters as it seems that is what crusade is tasked with next staff is going to be down here but they're not able to find the pick at least not as of yet He's going to just play this out, use himself as an active drone here, and maybe find the kill. But no, he's not going to be able to, but he runs in. IRX, he wants to get this plant down, but he's going to get gassed out. Crusade, he finds one back, but Papa P, he's going to get one as well. That's the diffuser down. And Snooki and Crusade, now been left in a 2v1 scenario. They can find themselves this round, and Papa P, he just looks away at the wrong moment, and it's Crusade. They're able to win that round back there, and it looked like it was lost for Kent State. They're able to win it all the way back. Well, that was just what Kent State needed to do to win that round. They sent it into sight and they simply won their ones. And if you can do that, even in a dire situation like it looked like it was about to be, you can win the round and that is exactly what they did. Brilliant play from both Crusade and IRX getting a couple of frags there and eventually that final kill falling onto Papa. The Valkyrie not able to to deliver that final kill once again. So the adaptation we talked about that KSU had to make, we didn't really see it from them. I do believe that round was largely in the favor of Kettering for the majority of that round. So admittedly, I was a bit surprised when the shots rang out and it was KSU who came out on top. 
But for KSU, that's just what they needed to start this off. Now they've got a little bit of momentum on their side. The confidence is starting to come their way. They're warmed up and they're ready to go. So as we go back to gym and bedroom, a challenging site to lock down on defense. I gotta say, Kent State here, if they can pull off something like they did in that last round, simply peaking at the right time and winning those ones, this one is gonna go a lot better for them than it did that first time around, Vial. I don't disagree with you there, but there's an overarching thing that I've noticed throughout these first three rounds is that the info game for Kent State isn't there. They're not really relying on their droning. They're not playing the info game. They're really just saying, we want to peek these corners, know where they generally are, and then force our way through a tight avenue. They really are sight oriented, which granted a lot of teams should be because they want to put themselves in a post plant scenario because that'll give them the most, you know, ample time to win and the most logical conclusion to win but they're not really playing off the info of each other they're not giving drone call outs at least it doesn't seem like and that one round that they won they won it based off of simple gunfights they weren't really doing anything else to aid them snappy here he's gonna try and delay that time that they can have looks like he's gonna send in a nade to get these bandit charges off the wall but maybe snappy's gonna go for it no, he's going to elect to fall back as the wall opens up and Kettering still have a chance, a very optimal chance here to win. Well, the push is once again appearing to be quite one-sided for Kent State, but with ample time on the board. They got the jacuzzi wall opened very expeditiously. This is going to allow them to approach from the other side. That's exactly what Jax is going to do, and Derp will fall victim to that cash push. And now... Two players working their way in from the east side. Their job, get Bucca out of cash and get control of construction. Control of construction to get that pressure mounting from that east side. But Bucca is going to make that easier said than done, of course. Bucca is tasked to lock this down. Papa's on the flank, though, but there is one player ready for it to come down. But the Zofia gets over aggressive and Goose hits the floor. Snappy with a response as well as IRX will be the next to fall. And Snooky with a follow-up will get the refrag on to Snappy. So keeping it even here in a 3v3 with a minute 15 to go. Now Snooky has worked their way in over into this jacuzzi hall, in the bedroom hall, and now has the possibility to get a more direct take onto the site. But with the site pressure split now, they have to get a coordinated push going and find these elusive defenders who are not giving any opportunities to Kent State to find these frags. They're playing passive and patient, but that's not what Anomaly's gonna do. Just as I say that, he will over-aggress and he'll get punished for it. Bucca has a response. 2v2 is what it's even now. Papa on the flank, looks for the player, the headshot delivered on a crusade. It's now a 1v2 with Snooky stuck in the shower. Snooky's gonna have to find two players to win this round. Very possible for him to pull this off. He knows where one is. It's going to be very close to him. He still has to also pick up the diffuser if he wants to extend this time of the round. But no, he actually wants to pull off a big brain play. He knows exactly where one is. And he's going to go for the hot take for the gunfight. But Buck is going to swing out and cover his team. And there we go. Kettering, they win this site once again. That'll be the last time they're going to be able to go back to it, though. So that could prove to be a huge factor for this team. It absolutely could. And what is something I really have to take note of here is how great it looks like Kettering are playing right now. We have seen a good bit of promise on attack from KSU, but Kettering's defense is really shining right now. They're playing extremely mature, extremely passive Siege, and it is working for them brilliantly. We saw them in that 3v3 situation where it really could have gone either way at that point. They played it passively. They simply just waited for KSU to walk on into the site because as the attackers, it is your responsibility to make a coordinated push happen. And once again, in round number four, it could not fall to the hands of KSU. We've seen some promise for them, but it's just not quite clicking Defender, all the way. And if they want to get another attacking down. round on this map, a defensive sided map, all, all of those things, all of those pieces of the puzzle need to be in the right spot for this to work out question is for this team what is that last piece of the puzzle is it the info game is it maybe playing more aggressive is it playing less aggressive is it going for trades we don't know or maybe we do know but it's up to them to find that last piece of the puzzle as we enter in here round number five the penultimate round of this half 
the question is, are they going to be able to lock down insertion. that elusive two four split? Granted, they could all go all the way back to make this a three three split, but Jay Z, I don't know because Kettering, it looks like they're playing just a, like you said, mature siege compared to Kent State. Yeah, it's going to be tough for this attacking squad to really get that traction on this site. We saw them get that success, like we mentioned, on that CCTV site earlier. And with Derp on the alibi, a pick that is always an interesting one to see. On Church and Arsenal, this is the time you then generally will see an alibi pick if you ever do. That is when things can get a bit dicey. If those alibi holograms don't actually do their job, if the alibi is not able to use those impacts to any effectiveness, then you have to question that pick entirely. But for now, in round number five, we're going to have to just wait a bit longer to see exactly how the alibi comes in to uh, uh, the effect in this round, rather, as the attackers have now worked their way up all the way into this first floor. They've cleared it out with their drones on that top floor, and they are ready to get these hatches open and get that pressure going onto the site itself. It's a very interesting take here coming in from KSU because they are just electing to have everyone together play off of each other, get all of these wall or hatches rather open as soon and as quickly as possible. The issue is they're not really establishing any other control around the map. They are just electing to have everyone play together, and lock it down together as they usually do. But with 90 seconds just about left on the clock, it's something that I question because they have to force their way onto site very soon and they don't have a lot of info. No one has really been watching on drones. They've mostly just been wandering around trying to find any gunfights. And that's the scary part that we talked about before. They're not really watching any drones. They're just looking for the information. The C4 rings out and a beautiful shot coming in from IRX. But no, it does he know that someone's going to be peeking in from the box. He's careful of it, but Derp, he wins that gunfight. But Papa gets refragged by Jax. Well, the trades ring out strong as Anomaly will find another dropping Snooky, the Maverick, to their early grave. So now, Goose has pushed up over into the, at least the Moto door and is eager to get the pressure going here. But this attack is once again coming from one side of this site. And now, as I say that, Jax and Crusade will be rotating around to blue. But is this rotation a little too late? We're going to have to see. Down the man count and now... Everyone knows exactly where you're coming from. This one is going to be a tough attack to further on as there are 30 seconds now remaining. Goose going to take quite a bit of damage down to about 25 HP as now Goose is desperately searching for some frags and pushing all the way up the hall. Bucka finds one. Crusade's the next to drop. Goose catches two off guard and will get the double kill, but Bucka has the trade. And now it's only one player left. It's the Jackal. It is Jax who finds a double kill on the round and finds another pick. But Derp is actually caught out of position and the headshot is delivered. Derp made a crucial error there, did not have to challenge, but brilliant play from Jax to find that frag and give KSU another round that they had no business winning. No business winning indeed. They had all the power positions there, and I was actually going to say that it looked like Bucka had the apex point there. If he was going to be able to hold off both of those players, that would have been it. They weren't going to be able to win that round, but Jax was going to be able to win that gunfight. And then Derp. He knew he was stuck, but I don't know if he needed to peek that. Granted, can't really redo that round, so they're going to have to redo the site as we head to our last round of this half before we swap. Now, KSU, they're winning their gunfights, yes, and that's what's really setting them apart for this map. But in terms of round count, they're still falling behind. So, Jay-Z, I have to ask you if there's one thing that can state at least has to be thinking when they go into their defensive half. What do you think they have to change up? I think, I mean, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what we're gonna, that we're gonna see from Kent State on the defensive half because we still have one more round to get there. But I do think seeing how Kettering approaches these sites on their attack will be a great indicator of the kind of competition between these two teams. Because these attacks from Kent State have been far from put together. And I rarely, you know, try to harp on, you know, certain mistakes that teams are making. But what it's so apparent right now is what Kent State are doing. They're simply just not getting coordinated pushes and they're not getting, you know, that control of the map and that multi-pronged attack that you always every single site on every single map you need to have a multi-pronged push and that's not what we're seeing here from ken state they have two rounds under their belt but 
they really have felt like fluke rounds. They really have felt like rounds that Kent State should not have won. Kettering had the advantage in the closing minutes, but from a couple mistakes from Kettering, a couple strong gunfights from Kent State enabled them to win those two attacking rounds. And so that is why we see the scoreline at two to three right now. So Kettering are going to need to win this round here to consider it a, you know, mildly successful defensive half. Four to two is your typical split on Clubhouse. But like I said, going into their second half, going into the Kettering attack and that Kent State defense, I think this is going to be the really the, the first indicator of what we're going to see for the rest of the night. This is also going to be the interesting part of this round because as we see Bucca on that vigil is playing all the way in strip and if you just delay as much time as possible now that they know with Jax of course on that jackal they know that he's in here and they want to flush him out because this could be a very very crucial point later on in the round if he's left to his own devices here however he's going to elect to stay as far away as possible but no he's only able to kill about 90 seconds off the clock they haven't even gotten anything open yet so now they have to rush to get everything open snooki he's gonna have to open up this hatch very quickly and irx has to open up any other hatch that isn't electrified as well unless he wants to go for the wall and the main advantage also in favor of su so still very likely that Kettering can pull this off but KSU do have a greater advantage. Yeah, we still have a minute on the clock. A good amount of time to work with if you're this attacking squad, but you still need to get this pressure continuing to mount on this site. Once again, it was a main stairs push that Kent State brought to the table, and now that has enabled them to get all the way up into Moto, and now they are making quick work of this church wall. The frag grenade rolls on through, but Anomaly will not be felled by that, but the player in Moto is gonna find one. Snappy hits the floor, but then Goose will TK, taking down IRX, and Derp will then trade the TK, finding the head of Goose, keeping it even in a 3v3. Now Snooki challenging some quick peeks over onto those Arsenal players, but not Nothing has been found just yet. Anomaly, I'm not sure if he is known. He's holding this very close position behind the bar. He's going to go for the swing, but he was caught out by Snooki because of that slow swing. And so now, with the plant on the deck, it is a post plant and a 1v3 post plant for Papa with 5 HP to their name. Caught unaware, but Jax will swing the angle and find the headshot with the C7E to deliver a brilliant attacking round win for Kent State. And this one looked clean. This one they deserved. And that is going to bring them to that 3-3 three to three split going into this second half. As deserved and as put together as it looked, I still have to be a little bit more scared if you're Kent State. Because as we saw, Anomaly was just holding on to a very, very slow peak angle. And he saw the head of Maverick. I don't know if he saw Snooki's head or not. But from our perspective, it looked very, very likely that he was able to see him, but elected to go for the swing instead. Maybe he thought that he was scoped in somewhere else, but still, I would have gone for the Attackers head of the Maverick the rather than the planter, because the planter still has to go through a whole animation to kill you. So I don't know if I agree with that decision, but granted, you can't relive rounds, as I said before. So we're going to swap halves as we head to a 3-3 split. And Jay-Z, Kettering, granted, they fell a little flat there in the last two rounds. But do you still give them the edge? Or do you think that maybe the momentum is shifting for Kent State in this map? Well, I would definitely say that Kent State has all the momentum right now. That was a couple of successful attacking rounds that they won, and Kettering may be a little bit on tilt here. 3-3 three to three on Clubhouse on your defense is not where you want to be, especially when an attacking team doesn't really have it all put together like Kent State struggled to do. So on their attack now, Kettering is going to have to go out with all cylinders firing if they want to get this momentum back. I think they have it in them. This is a pretty experienced team compared to Kent State. Definitely a newer team. But the one thing we're seeing already, the one thing I have to put a big question mark on is the lack of a secondary hard breach. On Clubhouse, when you have all of the hard breachers unbanned, there is no reason not to replace someone like a Jackal or you could even argue an Ash with an Ace who has a very powerful gun, or even Habana, who has the ability to do quite a bit of hard destruction. So Anomaly, the sole hard breacher, will be successful in opening up that... Oh, I don't believe it was, actually. A successful bandit trick will characterize that instead, as Derp 
will take out Goose. So Kettering did get an early pick, but they lost one exothermic charge, maybe both exothermic charges here, and now struggling to do much else. They are going to have to get this pressure mounting onto the site from elsewhere. Yeah, I believe they lost both exothermic charges, and that's going to be a huge blunder on them. Now they have to just rely on pure gun skills, and Snooki's going to win that first gunfight outright, and Jax is also going to win that. This is turning into a very, very good round here for KSU, but as I say that, of course, Snappy wins that gunfight once again. But, like we talked about before with Kent State when they were on the attack, they're going to have to funnel through on certain avenues of sight, and with no secondary hard breacher like you spoke about, Jay-Z not much they can do they really have to force their way through gunfights use flashbangs to try and get through and then hopefully win those gunfights outright but we know Kettering we know that they can win those gunfights the question is do they have the info to win those gunfights because it doesn't matter if you can win a gunfight just based off of range and pure gun skill do you know where they are to give yourself the advantage even with 60 seconds here left on the clock Kettering it looks like they might stall out here and just hope that somebody peeks into their crosshairs. Yeah, all Kettering can do right now is hope and hope that they win these ones when they push into sight eventually. That's exactly what Papa will do. The headshot delivered onto Jax. So now they have the advantage and now they have cash control. K both Crusade and IRX have backed on off and IRX with a C4 in hand is going to get caught out. And that's Snappy who delivers the fatal blow. Crusade has the response, but so does Papa and Kettering. They win a round number seven of the round that an attacking team seemed like they had no chance of winning. But when the 20 second meta comes through, when that final execute rears its ugly head, it was a push characterized by brilliant gunfights and a calculated aggression that won the round for Kettering. I think we got to start giving both these teams the credit that they deserve when it comes to these disadvantages, because yes, Theoretically, they have the disadvantage in most of these rounds, especially these attackers, but they are somehow able to pull it out each and every single time that we've doubted them, or at least a majority of the time that we've doubted them. So I think we got to start giving them a bit more credit and start hoping that even with exothermic charges getting knocked off the board, even with, you know, certain players falling very quickly, I think we, start, we have to start worrying about, you know, that later round because... When the later round happens, teams start getting desperate. They start playing more aggressive, and they start showing the flashes of brilliance that we love to see from certain players. So, I don't know. I, I think we just start have to worrying more when we get into the later round. And when we give a team a disadvantage, I don't think we can give them one because they're still playing very, very well. But we head into round number eight, of course. And they're actually going to replay this bomb site, them being Kent State. And what do you think of this, Jay-Z? We, we always talk about replaying bomb sites and if it's necessarily a good idea or not. Yeah, but yeah, we, we, we definitely... I mean, personally, I don't love to see the same bomb site twice because you have three, or definitely two, and as a Kettering showed, three viable bomb sites on this map you could very well choose to defend. And so going to the same one again simply means that there's something that you can do better. There's something you know you have the upper hand and you are going to make that adjustment and win the round. And honestly, in this particular case, I don't mind it too much from Kent State because they should have won that previous round. They had the advantage for the majority of that round, and it was only that last second push that went wrong. A couple of peaks from those defenders that did not have to be timed as they were resulted in that round falling to the hands of Kettering. And so choosing to make a little bit different decisions relating to those gunfights could be what Kent State needs to win this round here in round number eight. But Buck is going to change things up a bit and pressure from below, hoping to force off this bandit early. That's exactly what it will do. And now this exothermic charge was successful and Pop will be successful in finding the body of Goose, dropping Goose down to the floor. Man advantage now for Kettering with plenty of time still left on the clock and KSU now have to adjust. They have to play in different positions just in case you know, that players are going to be flanking them from certain angles. And it looks like this is, we're going to see a split push coming in like we talked about. It's all about that pronged assault. And we're going to see Bucca and Derp maybe go in from a certain or a different angle rather. And as I say that, Anomaly is going to find two onto the board and Crusade and Jax now left in a 2v5 clutch. It's not in a very good position, but there's two players that would be able to do it. It would be these two. 
So I don't want to write them off just yet. There's still plenty of time. And Kettering can play for the advantage and for the time. They still can use their drones and the info. And as I say that, Jax finds one, but he gets refragged by Bucka. And now that they know exactly where Crusade is, now they can just play their time and go in immediately. Not able to spot the head out there, which I believe was snappy, but I'm not exactly sure. As this plant is going to go Attackers are down. The bomb diffuser. Well, now in a post-plant crusade is going to have to find three pesky attackers or go for some sort of cheeky ninja defuse. But that's going to be a near impossibility as the attackers are well aware of his position on this raptor's rotate and are looking to shut him down no matter where crusade chooses to approach from. The peak from the breach will gain Snappy the kill and Kettering round number eight. They will go ahead five to three on the score line in this map which has proven to be relatively attacker sided it appears thus far it's something that we don't talk about often is that a lot of maps can really go attacker sided depending on how certain teams play it and ksu now electing to not go back to that bomb site so clearly something didn't work out there they elect to go down to church and arsenal here and i really don't know if there's anything that we can really I guess dissect because it really just looked like KSU just were able to win some of those gunfights. I absolutely agree and I do want to drive home one more point that you brought up is the how attacker sided this map can be depending on the teams in front of us and depending on the band attacker because when you see Habana on the table, can. Thatcher on the table, Ace and Thermite all on the table, they're all here and ready to be played. That makes this map attacker sided. I do believe this, the, the statistics, at least in Pro League, will back me up on that. If you let Habana and Thatcher through the ban phase, this map will generally lean to the attackers because every hatch can be opened, every wall can be opened because there are ample hard breaches on the board. But these attackers, they may not be capitalizing exactly on that Habana meta, especially with that big buff that Habana has recently received. But the Thatcher is in play, and it has been quite useful. But here in round number nine, Dirk will finally be bringing the Habana to the table. I am loving to see that, and it is going to be a godsend for this basement attack. Kettering here as well. They could really, they could put themselves on match point and then force KSU into a very, very tough spot for the rest of the map because then they would have to win three in a row to even force OT to guarantee themselves the map. So that's going to be a very, very dangerous spot to put in. Speaking of putting in, I don't believe, actually, I take that back now as I look at the roster. Jax does have some impact nades, so they could impact trick any of the Habana pellets that do have to come through. But no, it actually doesn't look like they're going to be able to or even want to. So Derp is going to get this hatch open very early on in the round and for free. That could be a huge mistake here by that team. Yeah, now with this roam clear starting to go down as Papa will continue that very important drone work, we're going to have to see exactly where this Kettering attack approached from. The church attacks from Kent State were the biggest crutch I believe that they had. I mean, they did find success in one of those attacks, but it never looked all that clean. There was some points where they struggled getting that pressure mounting, and now all eyes are on this Kettering attack and how they will differ this attacking strategy from what Kent State brought to the table on that first half. Obviously, the Habana, that is a big change, and that will result in the Moto Hatch being opened wide early on. IRX not able to place that Electro Claw in time. And so now we've got that Moto Hatch open. Your next step is to decide exactly where you want that crossfire from. Are you going to do a main stairs push, opening that church wall, or are you going to establish that crossfire on church from blue by pushing down secret and into oil pit? But for now, it appears that Anomaly will be tasked with that role of pushing down main stairs. The drones will be supporting them, so they, he will be figuring out exactly where these defenders are positioned. And as these defenders remain very stalwart, anchored in this site, this attack is still going to have to come through, and this intel is going to have to come through as well if this attack is going to have any success. The problem is with Kettering is that they are checking off every little bit of detail that they need to have done and set for this matchup. And I was going to say that it doesn't look like they're able to execute on anything 
and time is going to play a huge factor here. But as I say that, of course, picks will ring out here. Man, advantage here for Kettering here. But now, as I say that, Irax is going to find a second one. Will he be able to find a third? No. It's going to fall down all the way to Crusade. He's have to go on to his own Crusade if he wants to be able to win this round out for his team. Left in a 1v3. Nose 1 is in that Moto spot. And as he looks away, Kettering will run in front of him and net himself another kill. And match point now secured here for Kettering. Yeah, now match point on the horizon, and that will enable Kettering to really have their way with every single site that Kent State could possibly throw to them. Obviously, leading into this half, we talked about how important to, to this map and to really the status of these two teams it would be to see exactly how Kettering fared on this attack. And I've got to say that first round, it didn't look too clean. But after that, they cleaned it up, they cleaned their act up, and these back-to-back -back attacking Rins have looked quite strong it has not been disjointed they've pushed as a five man unit rather than as five individual players and that's the big difference we're seeing from kettering on this attack kent state did have a good amount of success on attack of course but the difference here is this attack is a bit stronger than kent state are prepared for even on their own map pick obviously that's something worth bringing up clubhouse was kent state choice the next map oregon Kettering has elected to go there next. So if that's any indicator of how things are going to go out, well, we can't exactly be sure. It is so common in Collegiate to take each other's map pick and go to that decider. But only time will tell as Kent State have once again elected to head back to the basement. The repeat site is Church and Arsenal. Ten seconds left. Yeah, I don't know if I like going back to this map, because, or this site rather, because now you're left in a match point. You have to throw something in the woodwork for this attack, because they are just playing lights out, it seems like. They really know exactly how to push together as a team. They're executing perfectly, it seems like. And it just looks like they have Kent State's number right now. And maybe this could be the toss-up for their team, Jax, as a vigil. This could prove to throw a huge wrench in this team along with Goose. However, we know that the drone work has been impeccable for this team. And it looks like they're exactly aware that people are at this top site, or rather this top floor. So they know exactly how to clear this out and force them all the way back in sight. Granted, if you're the defenders now, you want to play time. They know where you are. You don't want to force yourself into any stupid gunfights. So just try to waste as much time as possible but as i say that papa he's gonna reach double digits as he finds goose trying to fall back and still with two minutes left on the clock jacks is still up here yep the vigil is going to be an ever-present factor in this defense this is the change that kent state are hoping will win them this round extend that rome presence and hope that they can get that map control or at least delay the map control from going to the hands of Kettering. It looked like the Ash Bucka was almost going to challenge onto the cash room, but chose otherwise, and it's going to rotate back over to the remaining attackers. Without a Nomad on the board, the Vigil is in a very strong position to get a rotate because there is nobody on that immediate flank watch. Goose tried to join Vigil, of course, on that extension, but was caught out early and was a once again that early pick off the board. That could prove to be problematic, but our eyes are going to be on Jax and exactly what they are going to be able to do and possibly how effective this could be later in this round. But for now, the attackers are going to pressure directly onto this site. Snappy going to go for the roam clear, but it will be denied. So Jax will capitalize on that in a big way with that headshot, as will IRX, who delivers that. Jax with a double kill. Oh no, it's falling apart for Kettering. They did not take care of this vigil, and they're feeding him one kill at a time. Anomaly and Derp are all that remains of this attack, and they are going to have to find four hungry defenders, not to mention a very elusive Jax playing in construction. I think this round just boiled down to that Rome game and clearing it out because granted they took out Goose very early on and they must have thought, hey, maybe he's the only defender here. Maybe he's the only one that we have to worry about. But Jax was also there. Not anymore as Derp finds one back for his team. The question is, with 20 seconds left on the clock, are you going to force your way on the gunfights or maybe do say some KD? I'd like to use this as a sort of timeout. It looks like they want to use it as a timeout, but no, as I say that, Derp, he's going to force his way all the way onto site. Will he be able to win the first gunfight? No, he does not. Crusade wins that out. Anomaly just having to beat some wolves really quickly as Snooki 
closes this round out. Well, Anomaly could not make it happen, nor could Derp. The two remaining hard breachers tried to bring it back, but KSU will remain in this match, or this map, rather. They will not fall to map match point number one. There's two more match points on the horizon for them if they are going to want to bring this one to overtime. And here we are in round number 11, where they are headed back to CCTV and Cash to find that win and do exactly that. Bring it back and hopefully send this one to overtime. And we talked about the adjustment that Kent State made. It was extending that roam. It was Jax, the key player of that round, the vigil that could not be felled upstairs in construction, taking out every single player that challenged him. So a brilliant a job from the Vigil. Not so much from Goose, but it didn't seem to matter because the Vigil took care of that extended roam and the roam clear was unsuccessful for Kettering. So they're gonna have to iron out that roam clear and Kent State are gonna have to continue throwing a bit of roam to be that thorn in the side of this Kettering attack if they're gonna want to bring this one back here. Yeah, Kettering just didn't seem I don't want to say they look disorganized because they they have looked so organized over this matchup and it's kind of impressing me that a team has just been looking so well oiled compared to a lot of teams that we normally see so I'm thoroughly impressed but it seemed like they just they were almost too excited that they're on match point and said hey we got the first opening pick so let's try to force our way onto site it didn't really focus on any other players that could have been there they didn't fully clear out that top floor so maybe they elect to take more time to find someone but no instead they elect to bring bucka on the jackal and that could help them as well considering they know that robot is going to come out because that's exactly what kent state are doing and that's what Attack what's going to lead to most likely another win if they can force this to all 12 rounds well now with 30 seconds burned in this round it appears that the jacuzzi wall has been opened wide, and this roam play, or at least that extension from Snooky, has at least been dealt with. Snooky will head back to the site, rotating away to join their teammates on the site itself. Goose is a persistent roamer here. Downstairs in the bar, teased a run towards Strip, but has since recoiled and gone all the way back towards Lounge. There is another player that is elusive as well, Crusade is still the player that needs to be dealt with if they're going to want to get this clear up to that site. Crusade simply hanging out on rafters, but no attacking pressure is mounting from there whatsoever. This entire attack is devoted to this west side take. Now this play, I do very much love to see a good old-fashioned construction take. However, the one problem with this attack is if you devote all five attackers to it, it can get quite dangerous if you don't establish that crossfire using that wall opening up that cctv wall but that's exactly what anomaly is going to be up to right now but there's a flank to be worried about from snooki creeping their way up the main stairs and these attackers are going to have to be very careful once again there's no nomad so they don't have the ability to lock off those flanks and jacks with the c4 rains on through and that is going to connect with the head of bucca or the whole soul of bucca and the jackal will be taken out early Still also not aware of Snooky, who can go for a very, very late flank. Elects to wait even longer, but he's going to find a early kill here. This is proving to be very, very advantageous here. And the roam game is exactly what Kent State have figured out that they need to use to win. Snooky is now going to put that flank into effect. Finds one, but he gets traded out immediately by Papa. And Snappy finds one back as well. 35 seconds about left, but Jack is going to get one for his team once again. And they're going to force their way on into sight. And they're not expecting it, but it doesn't matter. Because Kent State is going to force all 12 rounds on us as the kills reign true for them. They did indeed. KSU is staying in this fight. It is now five to six. It's still match point, but it is definitely winnable for Kent State here. But Vial, the big problem and the focus of this round is all that is left is the tertiary and quaternary bomb sites for KSU to go to. They've avoided Jim like the plague for the entirety of this second half, but to take this to overtime, this is a defensive performance that they are going to need to iron out and get this one going. We haven't seen Jim in bedroom from KSU thus far. They've never brought it to the table, but 
if they are going to win this round, they are going to have to lock down this tertiary bomb site with all their might. A hard site to defend, but as Kettering proved on that first half, it is a site that is absolutely possible to defend. As long as you play patient, you play mature, you can win your gunfights if you force the attackers to wait into those last few seconds to push on through. We're not going to see any surprises in terms of our lineups for either of these attacking or defensive squads. One thing to note, Anomaly will be finally switching off that Thermite roll and will be electing to bring those Selma charges that Ace wields. It's going to prove to be a, I think, a smarter pick here because instead of just two exothermic charges that granted yes to get a bigger portion of the wall open in a lot quicker amount of time you're bringing in three types of breaches which is going to play a factor into how much of the wall you get open and if they're going to elect to bring a bandit which of course irx did it's going to prove that they can just you know play as much time and hopefully get a pick on to the feet of irx and that's going to prove you know, I said prove a lot, but what both these teams are going to do. Kettering now is very aware of this Rome game because the Rome game twice in a row have given Kent State the edge. And that's going to prove that they need to do something else. And I'm going to stop talking before I say prove one more time. <laughs> well, it is a tougher site to roam on, and Snooki will be proving that for us as Bucka will be taking down that sole player on this cash extension. Like I was saying, Jim and Bedroom, it is hard to get a good roam here. All you can really do is hope for that cash extension to work out well. We do, of course, have a cheeky roamer hanging out below. That is Goose, hoping to be affected by rotating up the red stairs here, and it might happen right now. Here comes Goose, working their way up. I'm not sure if this flank is known, as all of these attackers have started to bunch on up in general outside construction, rather, as Papa and Bucca and Derp have relocated and are playing outside on the windows. Papa feels the pressure of a Jaeger nearby, but no feet are going to be found. And so as a result, the Jack was going to push on through, gets caught unaware, and Goose delivers the opening frag for KSU. Derp seeks the refrag desperately, but will not find it. The trades come on through, but nothing is found. And Goose, escaping with their life, will now prove to continue to be a thorn in the side of this attack and a thorn that needs to be dealt with if Derp wants to get this construction pressure going. 60 seconds now left in this round. Kettering, if they're able to win this out in a beautiful shot coming in from Derp, that's the man advantage now. The question is, where are they going in? Bucca gets his double kill for the round in IRX and Jack. Now left in a very unwinnable scenario. Kettering, they finish it out at round 12. It took all 12, and Ken State wanted to push it that far, but it didn't matter. Kettering still looking as organized as they were before, but Jay-Z... If we're watching Kettering, and if you're a fan of them, you have to be worried about that Rome game heading into map number two. I think I think you bring up a great point. I think the Rome game is definitely something we're going to have to watch on Oregon. Of course, Oregon is a map that you can... The Rome can have mild success. Sometimes it works really well, but if you have some good pre-placed drones, you have a good Rome clear, you can shut down any Rome game on Oregon in an instant. So it's not going to be the easiest thing to both Rome or clear the room on Oregon, but we're going to have to wait exactly to see how that one plays out. We're going to send it to a quick break, and after this, we're going to see how Oregon, Kettering University's pick, will play out. Of course, Kettering had that win, so if they take map number two, it is all over, folks, and that will conclude this matchup. But we'll see you in a few moments. We will be right back.
Think about it, ring won't tell you what I saw. When you break it off, you'll see who had it all.
my own, broken and alone. I feel the rain crashing down. All around this empty town, we're searching for the lost and found. But you don't care, you're unaware. Keep moving like the scars aren't even there. It's in the air, like a blazing flare. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us. If you're just joining us, it was map one, characterized by a lot of interesting attacking strategies, some interesting ban phase, but overall a great map one, and I am stoked to see map two. Once again, my name is Jay's Wills, and I am joined by Vial on the desk tonight. Vial, we saw a great map one. Talk to me. What are your expectations going into Oregon? Well, the only expectation I want to see is that both of these teams adjust because we didn't really see a lot of that happen from both of these teams, except maybe on the last round. And I don't even think we saw the winning team, Kettering, come out with an adjustment. They really didn't watch their Rome game. And then when we look at Kent State, their attacks just weren't organized. They were very funneled, and that never really adjusted like we talked about during that map as well. So... If there's one thing that I want to look forward to and I hope to see on a map like Oregon, I hope to see those two things adjust because in terms of a Rome game, a Nomad is a more prominent pick on Oregon, or at least it usually is. But we've seen a lot of things strange happen in today's matchup. Like, we only saw Ace Bra, I believe, once in that entire map. And we also only saw Habana, I believe, brought once as well. Yeah, that was it was an interesting way the attacking teams chose to approach Clubhouse. Normally, if Habana is not banned, you're going to pick Habana every single time. But on Oregon, the, the same mainstay operators are a bit more fluid. You don't have to bring the Habana. You could opt for just a Maverick as your hard breacher in combination with a Thermite, and that's fine. You throw an Ace in there, and you're doing fine as well. So it's really going to be interesting to see exactly what these attacking teams bring to the table because that is what the difference will be on this map compared to the last one the attacking is where things got a bit dicey for both of these teams so if they iron that out i think things will go a lot better once again our ban phase is going to be pretty curious the yana ban will be the first ban on the table and it will of course be kettering who elected to ban that clearly a target ban towards kent state and the jackal off the board as well is no surprise that's going to be Kent State hoping that their roam play will be furthered by the lack of a Jackal. I think it's really an info game that they want to get rid of for this attack. Because if you have no info as an attacker, you can really just put pressure on the defense. And they won't even know what will hit them. So, in the last ban running through will be Malusi. Another staple ban that a lot of teams, you know, have started shifting a ban four and it makes a lot of sense you don't really want to be playing against a malusi she offers plenty of information slows you down and it just sometimes can be a pain to play against but we're gonna start round number one and it's gonna be kettering on the defense once again and it looks like goose might be electing to bring out the twitch this is an operator that we don't normally see played on any team yeah, the Twitch is definitely more unique pick in the competitive Siege setting. Some argue the viability of the Twitch simply because the F2, the FAMAS, whatever you want to call it, it's a strong weapon. But regardless, we won't be seeing the Twitch. It's a six pick to the Nomad, an operator we saw played almost never by at least the Kettering side of that previous map. But Kettering's, of course, starting on defense, and we are going to see Laundry and Supply Room the first site of Oregon. What normally characterizes this site is deployable shield central. Often we will see teams bring four, three to four deployable shields on this site, but because of that Goyo ban, there will only be one 
brought by Anomaly the Smoke, looking like Anomaly will be putting that in blue in J Bunker. That will be the position that the shield will be played. But a more interesting pick is Bucka going with the Clash. Now, as much as Clash does not make the more common appearances in Comp Siege, on this particular site, this is one of those few sites where Clash is showcased because Clash can not only be a very good information operator, just hold a doorway and provide callouts, but you can also simply just block off the attackers from coming in a certain direction. Using that, you know, electricity, that shock that Clash can do with her shield, you can stall out the attackers and really make it a pain to approach from every which way. Of course, we do have four frag grenades to be the bane of the Clash's existence, and we're gonna have to see exactly how that will factor in here. But something to note already is the drone utility, not to mention the life of IRX is suffering for this Kent State attack with more of most of their drones already taken down and their Thermite, they're one of their two hard breachers off the board early. Yeah, and I also want to speak on this Clash. It's one of those operators that you see more of active utility, like a Pulse, as I like to speak on when I speak of active utility. Clash is one of those operators that, at least on this map, not only on this site, I would argue, is that this map in general, she is extremely powerful. She offers you plenty of active utility, and she just plays into a very vital role. She can lock down an entire hallway area of the map that, you know, depending on where the attack is coming from, can really make them stall out. The only question is, how do you deal with her in Kent State? Well, they brought four frag grenades, and that could prove to be a very, very vital part, but they've got counters to that. They have the Whammy, the Frisbees. They have those in play, and they also have Jaeger with all the ADSs. So, plenty of ways to get around this clash, plenty of ways to counter that way around as well, and it looks like KSU actually might elect to just go straight through stairs. Yeah, this laundry push is not uncommon, but usually you'll see a crossfire established with Freezer as well. And if you're not going to establish that crossfire, that is going to allow Bucka to walk straight up in your face and block off this doorway. As I say that, it looks like KSU will now be pivoting once again and trying to find a new way to approach from because Bucka is ever present at every single turn. They cannot seem to get that castle, I mean, the, excuse me, the clash off the board. They will take Derp off the board as Goose will find that frag. The first frag grenade will rain on through from Snooky, but it will indeed get burned by one of those Wamai magnets. As the push now continues to mount, this push from this south and this west side, this crossfire established, it's Jax who actually goes down. Goose unable to find the refrag snap. He gets over aggressive and is punished for it, hunting for the downed player. But Papa will find the response, taking down Snooky. And now Crusade is stuck between a rock and a hard place, staring down a clash, but able to take all the damage, or almost all the damage, of Papa as the Wamai went running on away. Snappy still down, but not out as Jax will get revived and find one, but Papa has a response. The double kill delivered. Anomaly, the M590 takes the head, and as will Papa. The AUG delivers the head on the swing. Goose hits the floor, and Kettering will take the first round on Oregon. A very, very hectic round here for both of these teams. Kettering, they were in the driver's seat for a majority of that round, and even up until the last two seconds when they were getting that diffuser down, I would argue that they were still in the driver's seat, not only in terms of man advantage, but in terms of those power points, because when we were watching, I believe, was Crusade on that sledge, five seconds, or just about seven seconds left on the clock, and he was trying to get rid of the Clash and the Wamai of Derp in Freezer, that's just not what you want to be doing with five seconds left. You want to already have Freezer at least locked down, or you want your attack to have shifted somewhere else. So a huge blunder there coming in from KSU, just Attackers not playing their crossfires, not clearing out the angles that they needed to. And Kettering, they're going to win that first bomb site outright. So now it's going to be down to them to go to this top floor site. Now, this top floor site, I think once again, the focus is going to be on this Kent State attack and how they are able to take control of games and establish that crossfire. The big word of the night I've been using a lot to characterize these Kent State attacks has been crossfire or lack thereof. A lot of their attacks, even when they have the full manpower, have been very one directional. They've been very tunnel vision on approaching from one particular part of a bomb site. And as a result, that particular avenue can turn into a fatal funnel 
all of your attackers can end up dying from a very similar angle if that crossfire is not established. And on Oregon, on this top floor, it is crucial to establish the game's crossfire, that 180 degree crossfire between that closet wall that you will attempt to open, the trophy door that you will attempt to gain access to, and the attic side, which it appears that Crusade will be assisting to open up very early on. If you can do that, if you can get these three points of control, you've accomplished your win condition. You've done your job. All that is left to do is put the diffuser on the floor. But what is interesting is we're not seeing that crossfire that I just described was so vital. All five attackers are bunched up on the north side. All five are approaching from this attic part of the building, and that is not what you'd normally like to see for a successful attack to work out well. Not only that, I don't necessarily see them anymore, but there was somebody roaming on that bottom floor site, and I believe it might have been Bucca. Bucca still has the opportunity to come back and flank them, and Bucca is on the far west side of the map trying to maybe hear something catch someone off of a flank try and delay as much time and see if he finds anybody try to make it so there's no way that they would suspect him but they're definitely suspecting something here and that roam game is something that ksu was able to vitalize very well when they were defenders so they're going to be just as aware of it bucka wants to go for a cheeky wall bang but not able to find anybody as of yet it's Snooky. He's going to find Anomaly as the first pick. And Derp, a ill-advised peek onto Snooky. I don't know what he was thinking there. Hopefully, he was thinking he could win that gunfight. But clearly, he was not going to. Grenade will try to get rid of that Maestro Cam. And it does. No info now for this defense as it's left in a 3v5. With just about 60 seconds left. And as, as I say that, Goose finds one back. It's now a 2 Five. Will it be a 2v4? Yes, it is. Snappy's going to win one as he snaps to the head of Crusade. And the C4 brings out, will it catch one? No. Snooky on low HP, but not enough to knock himself down. Well, now it is up to Snappy and Bucka to hold off this one directional push, but it is going to be easier said than done. There are four attackers to find, and they are actively getting all the information they need. They've got the drone work, and they've got the clock. They've got ample time to work with here. But Bucka and Snappy, all they need to do is wait this out and just win there one. Snappy will get another one. The headshot is delivered. The double kill for the Kaid, and he's on the hunt for more. Goose is holding that angle in kids, looking to find something here, but no defender is getting out of their anchored position. They are simply waiting for these attackers to swing. IRX will do exactly that, as will Snappy, and he'll get the quad kill. He needs the ace, but it will not be found as Goose gets the shots onto Snappy, and it will be KSU with their one directional attack that ends up working out and pays dividends for them, winning them round number two. Well, when you've got only one person focused in on one angle, just holding mouse one, hopefully everyone doesn't elect to run through the exact same angle, but they do, and that almost costs them the round because of one person snapping onto their heads, and it's snappy. So, I, I, I like you, like we talked about in the first map, it seems like these attacks coming in from KSU are very one-directional. They're funneling through very specific avenues, and they don't really want to change that up. Granted, they had a little bit more info there, and they knew exactly where everyone was, so they knew that they just had to win those gunfights or force their way onto site. The only issue was they weren't able to force the diffuser onto site, and they weren't able to win the gunfights. So now we're going to see a repeat of this bomb site in Kettering. They clearly feel like they can redo that. I think that they would, they should have been able to pull that off because two ill-advised peaks and uh, in in the attic rather. I really don't know what else to say than Kent State. I think that may have been like we talked about in the last map, a fluke round. Well, these rounds do keep stacking up and they're playing out in very similar ways. So at some point, we've got to step back and realize, well, these aren't flukes. These are just simply well-played attacks from Kent State. I mean, sure, it's not what you would expect to see, but at the end of the day, they played that well. They waited for every defender to swing into their open arms. They, The defenders did exactly that, obviously, except for Snappy, who proved to be so elusive, but they played it. It was a patient attack. It was a methodical attack, and it ended up working quite well for them. They found very early traction, eliminating every single defender who tried to challenge onto them, 
And once again, we're going to have to see how this attack is going to swiftly deal with a pesky roamer. It is Bucka holding in T3, hoping to stall out this push from the attic side as long as possible. This is going to prove to be a very dangerous peek here coming in from Bucka. And if he's not careful, he can get caught off guard. He knows that someone is on that first window. Does he know where they're going to peek from? There's plenty of other windows he has to be wary of. He's not aware that I believe it is Snooky that is on the upper part of that window. But instead, Snooky likes to fall away to that bottom floor. And that could prove, or bottom portion of that window, that could prove to be a very dangerous avenue for him. And he's just going to delay as much time as possible. Nade rings in and only about 25 HP, or rather 20, 30-ish HP will net him anything. Now the crossfire is going to be set up by both of these players. The head might pop out if they're not if they're not careful here. Bucka is going to get naded once again, but 90 seconds left off the clock is when this first pick rings in. That's a Jaeger off the board. That isn't anybody with any active utility. And that's going to prove to be very dangerous here for Kent State as they know other players are still on the board and Derp is going to look to get very aggressive here. And the swing just doesn't work out for him. He knows that they're there but no bullets land and find the heads. Well, the play from Bucko. While his life was lost, job well done on the T3 play. That's all you can really ever hope for playing up there in tower. You're gonna die eventually. The question is when. And Derp, dying much earlier than needed, will once again swing out over-aggressing and will pay the price for it. So already, Hettering are on the back foot once again. Papa's hoping to equalize with the Alda, raining 81 bullets on down towards the sledge. But Crusade will not be felled and will remain alive in hoping to find some more traction on this round. But Goose will be no more a factor in this round as Snappy delivers that fatal blow and a 4v3 is now what Kent State are staring down. Of course, they've got the man advantage, but the time has whittled away because of that great roam play from Bucka early on. Now a C4 comes out from Snappy. It's not going to land once again, but Snooky will once again aggress on this doorway. Papa holding a position, hoping they push on through. Snooky will do that and find Snappy. That's a double kill for him, and it will be two defenders remaining. Snooky goes for the flank. IRX finds one, and Snooky will deliver the fatal shots, and Kent State their one directional attack seems to be too much for Kettering to handle, not able to stall out this five-man attic push, and Kent State will take back-to-back -back attacking rounds, a two-to-one scoreline now. Now I think it's where Kettering have to switch up where they're going to go. They have that bottom floor site as an option, and I think they have to elect to go there, because now that it's open, they go there, they, you know, they're able to win that one hopefully and then maybe they elect to go up to that top floor site and try and tie up the loose ends delay more time possibly or maybe they elect to go for a tertiary bomb site i personally think that they should go for a tertiary bomb site if they are of course able to win this one and if they aren't attackers need to locate we have to ta bomb. start talking about ksu these one directional attacks are starting to pay off especially if you can win your gunfights maybe it just took them a map to get warm who knows yeah, they've clearly gotten warm and they're clearly winning all their ones. Every single gunfight seems to be falling in the favor of Ken State, Ken State right now. And going back to, to, to the basement site here, back to Laundry and Supply, it's going to be Kettering who now have the onus on them to respond. They need to get this momentum back. It is Oregon after all. This map generally plays out defensive sided. Of course, the meta is changing in favor of the attackers, I'd say, but... No way should the attackers come out ahead. At least it should not be 4-2 to two in favor of the attack at the end of this. 3-3 three to three is probably what the attackers are hoping to get here. That's probably the best case scenario, but four rounds for them would be exceptional if they can continue to pester these Kettering defenders and shut down every time a Kettering defender will over-aggress or swing an angle that they have no business swinging. But last time, what characterized this basement defense was some early picks that went in the favor of Kettering and Kent State struggled to find exactly where they wanted to push from onto the site. We saw them go to laundry, then go to freezer, then go back and forth, and then eventually they decided on a combination split take from the west side of that basement. The freezer and laundry combination attack did not end up working out. But the first part of this attack, it's the roam clear, and it has been largely successful on that top floor. So now they will be extending that drone work to the second floor and eventually to attacking the basement itself. I 
Granted, no one should be roaming all the way at that top floor in Attic, but if someone was, I would say Goose would have lost that gunfight. Because I I just don't understand the logic behind going in there without a drone in for you first, or just a drone in general rather than yourself. Because if it's a drone, yes, you sacrifice a lot of information for later on or finding any more info later, but at least you don't pay the price with your life, which is a bigger value than a drone, especially if we're talking overall for this matchup. And and we're going to start seeing, you know, a split combo push like we saw later on in that last, or the last time we were at this site. 5v5 still with under 90 seconds left to go. And Snooky, he is wary of an of a flank, and so is Goose. I don't know what this team is scared of, but every single player is on this bottom floor. So I don't know what's going on for them, and they're wasting plenty of time with it. 60 seconds left to go. They have to force them out of position and into sight eventually. Yeah, but they these defenders are not uh, being picked off here. They are refusing to go down. Snappy's going to take Goose down to about 20 HP and look for the flick onto another, but it will not land. Now at 2 HP, Snappy's going to hope to toss a C4, but it's actually going to land on the close side of the wall. Now Snooky working their way up into this freezer in combination with that laundry side push from the rest of the team. They're going to hope to get this crossfire established. IRX will do that. We'll find one, but Crusade will be taken down with a trade from Papa. Goose sneaking on into prone angle, but the Toxic Babe's gonna take out one as Derp will find a double kill, and it will be all up to Jax in the closing seconds of this round. Four players to find, and Bucca is just gonna stare at the Zofia for the remainder of this round. There is nothing Jax can do when stared down by a treacherous Clash, who's just gonna be slowing down the Zofia at every turn. The SMG-11 will close the round off. The headshot delivered by Anomaly and Kettering will go ahead to equalize the scoreline at 2-2. Two to two. Yeah, it's kind of... I don't want to say that the attack was almost stalling out because they knew exactly where they wanted to come from. They knew that they wanted to do a split push, which is something that we, you know, haven't seen come out from KSU. So I'm I'm kind of impressed that they even wanted to do that. But they didn't find any picks and they were worried about a flank that was never coming. Again, this is what I was talking about. When you don't have a drone either set up for you there or a drone just going in and checking in every single angle, you start to face check everything and start panicking. You don't have a drone there set up. So they elected to go all the way to the top floor to Attackers check to again if anyone was there, but no, nobody was there. Kettering, like I talked about before, however, will be switching over to a kitchen and dining bomb site. Now, this is them adjusting, of bomb course, to not being able to win that top floor site, and I like this adjustment. I absolutely agree. I think this is a good adjustment. They cannot seem to hold down that four or five man attic push. Instead, they're going to be opting for this tertiary bomb site. Two interesting things of note here, of course, we have the Oryx and we have the Alibi. Both of these operators, not the most common picks, but can be effective when combined when you get Papa working a bit of a extended roam, popping up and down hatches, and you've got the Alibi, you bring in a deployable shield and some possible free intel if you use those holograms appropriately. But what's going to characterize this round is the top floor hold, that vertical control that is going to be so important for both teams to secure. When you're defending either of these tertiary bomb sites, either meeting or kitchen or dining or kitchen, that top floor control is essential to any strong defense or any strong attack. And that is why we see our defenders setting up quite a bit of utility up there. And that is also why we are going to see these attackers working their way in from the tower side. They're going to look to take that attic control and storm their way in from there. A little bit of damage dealt onto Bucca. I believe that was a bit of a wall bank coming in. But also, the issue is when you play this site, or rather when you don't play the meeting site, is that the attack doesn't have a, you know, line of sight into. When you play this, you basically can play this as if you are at meeting. You can reinforce that wall, play a little bit more passive than you would meeting. But now, you give up a little bit more territory without having to worry about, you know, anybody coming in immediately in. And speaking of immediately in, it's going to be Snooky and Crusade, along with Jax. They know exactly where they want to push in from. And they are going to pull off the attic once again. It doesn't look like anything has changed, at least as if this top floor bomb site was in play. 
First pick will ring out now. IRX, he's going to win that fight onto Derp. Papa's going to get the refrag onto Goose. Very early pick for both of these teams. Or actually, it's more of a mid-round pick for both of them as 90 seconds are still left on the clock. Reloading. Well, Bucka will find the headshot with the UMP and a brilliant flick. What a shot from Papa landing the headshot onto Crusade. That is going to be a 2v4 now. Kettering with a substantial man advantage with Snooki and IRX, the remaining attackers to do all this work left. And the vertical control has not even been established yet. As two minutes now tick away off this clock, Buck is now caught in this corner, a brutal position to be held to say the least. But Anomaly will assist that, make it a bit easier for Bucka. A C4 raining from below will take out the Thermite. It's all up to the Maverick, caught between a rock and a hard place, needs to find something, but will be sprinting around, and the Super Shorty will be the end of Snooky. Bucka with a brilliant play, a nice double kill for the castle on that round, will characterize that one and give Kettering that round win, taking it now to that 3-2 scoreline. 3 to 2 scoreline it is and the only question is do they elect to go to that top floor and yes it looks like they will rather than going to a meeting hall kitchen and I don't know if I like this call here because even with you know them holding off that pressure in the attic they still weren't able to win those one-on-one -on -one gunfights in the attic it had to take a flank and had to take a later on push when they were in to what seemed to be games and kids so I don't know if I agree with him going up to this top floor site, but we will see if anything adjusts. And speaking of Defender, adjustments, I believe the Echo, yes, on Papa is in play. Yeah, the Echo will be brought out. It's always good to see Echo back in the meta, especially because he has been released from his quarantine period. But because of that sizable Echo nerf, those drones are no longer invisible. The way you play Echo has changed a bit. You can't simply just place the drone on the ceiling early round and hope it stays there for the remainder. You have to tuck them in some precarious positions, hide them in tougher spots to see on the ceiling in hopes that either you can gain some intel before they're shot out or hope that the attackers don't bother to check for them before they go for the plant in those closing seconds. But you mentioned it, Vial, this top floor hole that has been so elusive for Kettering thus far is going to be so important to focus on here. The one thing they have not been able to stop has been the five stack attic push. It has seemingly been too strong for Kettering to handle. But there's one adjustment, only one adjustment they need to make. Don't swing those attic angles. Once, just let them walk up attic and just hold the crossfire into kids and into games. If you hold that, we saw Snappy get a 4K. It was easy for Snappy because it was a fatal funnel that they walked on through. They, all this defense has to do is allow the attackers to walk through those fatal funnels that it clearly seems that they are so eager to do so. They want to just send it into sight through a doorway. They don't want to bother getting a hard wall open in closet or establish this crossfire. So Kettering is going to need to make that adjustment to win this round. It is going to be so important because 4-2 to two scoreline is exactly what you're looking for on defense, on your own map, especially when going on to attack. The only scary thing I am worried about is rather than giving up the early pick, which Derp is actually able to win that gunfight now at the attic, which is something that he hasn't been able to do very often. Now, the only question is, is Bucka still on that late flank? And maybe is he going to be able to pull it off? The no, he elects to come back into armory, and it makes a lot of sense not wanting to play too aggressive. But the man advantage now in favor of Kettering, something that they haven't got on this top floor site once. Only question is, will the time be a factor? 90 seconds still left to play, but they do have this attic wall open, and they have to get rid of Derp, but Derp's gonna swing and find himself a second kill. He's actually being able to win out these gunfights, but Snooky says no more to Derp, as now the gunfights will halt for a little bit as some goo mines will ring out, and now they're actually going to reinforce that kid's wall. I don't know how I feel about that, JC. Honestly, it's a perfect adjustment because you have every single attacker stuck in the attic and you know it. And now they're surrounded by hard walls and only one door to go through. Of course, there's a thermite. He could use that exothermic charge. But as we've seen from Kent State, they don't like opening hard walls. They like sending it through a doorway. And so now they are forced to make a huge adjustment. 
a brilliant decision to use that pocket reinforcement. You have to applaud that adjustment. And now, now it exactly. seems that Kent State are forced to make a huge pivot with 30 seconds to go. Now Snooki's gonna enter Master, a place that no Kent State attacker has been entering from thus far tonight. And IRX will hit the floor. Snooki finds one headshot. Oh, oh my goodness, what a flick and a shot through the wall. That was impressive. I'm going to have to check those Moss files there. But it's now a 2v2. But Papa will answer back and make it a 1v2 with the headshot delivered with the MP5S. And now it is up to Papa and Snappy to seal this one off. Here comes Jax pushing on through, but it will be denied. And Kettering, with that adjustment being the key point of that round, they will take it and they will take that 4-2 to two split on their own map of Oregon. At least they were able to find some traction there on that bottom floor site. And they made that adjustment. And clearly the adjustment was Derpy, or Derp rather, excuse me, had to just win out that gunfight. And he won two. So that adjustment. But now we swap halves here. The 4-2 split, of course, in favor of this attack. And that's the only question is, are they going to be wary of these roamers? And it doesn't look like it because they aren't electing to bring a nomad. Now I could speak too soon. But no, the sixth pick is actually going to be a Capitao, another operator that we haven't seen very often, along with the Twitch. Attackers These are two operators that we don't normally see have come out very often competitive play. Capa Capitao a little bit more than Twitch, yes, but there are plenty of operators that other teams elect to bring rather than, you know, these two. One being Nomad that Kettering have yet to play once. I don't know if I agree with this because Kent State, they've brought the Oryx. A typical roam operator that, knowing Kent State, are going to elect to use on the roam. So, this could prove to be very scary here as we enter in this top floor site. And now, sitting here on the back foot, Kent State are in need of some aggression. They're in need of a solid roam, like you mentioned, Vial. I think you brought that great point, bringing that intel that we gained. Um, from that spectator's point of view, you know, from Clubhouse. We saw how effective the roam can be, and it is something that Kettering are going to have to deal with, you know, very efficiently if they are going to want to win these attacking rounds. You've got Snooki holding in small tower, and you've got Goose hanging out in the meeting hall. Of course, Snooki has now been droned, so he is now vulnerable, and Bucka is going to be looking to capitalize, but missing those shots, the timing not capitalizing there. But Snooki is now caught out in a brutal position, and Bucka will find the headshot that is roam clear dealt with at least that first roamer now it is goose to deal with and if you can deal with goose that is the roam gone and that is exactly what kettering struggled with on map number one and that could very well be all they need to do to take this round and take this map here we're gonna see more of our default strategy here taking this in a more traditional manner opening up closet establishing that crossfire papa and bucka will light up the scoreboard crusade will fall as will Jack. So it's all up to Goose and IRXS, but he will not be able to do it. Derp has the headshot onto one, and Bucka with the other. A flawless round from Kettering. Wow. Yeah, you put it best. Wow. There isn't really much else to say other than they were able to win the 101 gunfights. They saw that there were roamers on, and they were able to find one. I don't know if they were aware of Goose on that roam, and that could have proven to be a very fatal flaw if they were able to, you know, extend that round a little bit more, but no, now they have their fifth round on the board. And now two rounds away from not only closing out this map, but also this matchup. And this looks like all the momentum is in favor of Kettering. I would absolutely agree. They are now storming ahead to a 5-2 to two lead in a map that looked so close in that first half. It is slowly slipping away from Kent State's fingers. If they're not careful, Kettering could run away with this, and the scoreline, it wouldn't look too pretty for them. It could very well be that 14-7 to scoreline if Kent State aren't able to rack up a couple of these defensive victories. And they are going to head straight back to Kids. We've talked about going to the same site twice. It can be questionable, especially if you don't make, you know, drastic changes to change things up a bit but that's exactly what kent state are going to hope to do here hopefully their roamers uh won't be caught out as early on hopefully they won't lose those early players and lose that early momentum that kettering took and then stormed ahead with that site pressure but in round number eight all eyes are going to be on that roam clear all eyes are going to be 
if Kettering can replicate some of that last round success and maybe even deliver another flawless round. I don't, I don't necessarily love calling out players, but Crusade through eight rounds right now, or rather seven rounds, has yet to find a single frag. And he's been mostly playing operators that have, you know, those entry roles or those fragging roles. So it's not necessarily a big deal if somebody isn't able to find a frag in one round, two rounds, three rounds. But come down to it, those kills do make a difference, especially when you just had a round that was flawless. And this team is just looking to is looking and playing a lot more on the front foot than being Kettering. And the only question is, are they going to flush out these roamers, Snooky and Goose? Once again, these two are on the roam game, and they can just wait it out, play some time. And that's the scary part about this roam game. If they play time, if they just elect to play the off angles that these attackers will not be expecting, we can see something happen that's very special here for Kent State, which is that roam game that Kettering don't really pay mind to a lot of the time. First pick does come out, though, in favor of Kettering. Jax falls. Derp also finds a second on the round as he's actually already on site. He is looking to end this here and now. Buck finds one back as Snooky falls. So does Crusade and Goose. He finds one back, but he's left in a 1-4 scenario. He's got to ace clutch it. And Derp, triple kill on the round. Finishes it out. Match point secured. And there we go. It's going to take a four-round flawless streak here from Kent State to push this to just OT. Well, Goose there stopped the flawless round from going on the board, but match point is now on the horizon. Goose could not stop that. This one looked so close at the beginning, but Kettering, oh my, have they put on a performance. They've come into their element. They're playing as a team now, and nothing that Kent State can throw at them is getting through the cracks. Kettering are playing well. They had a perfect roam clear on that last round, and even so, they knew where the roamers were, and they sent it directly onto the site. They saw an opening that Kent State allowed them, and they seized the opportunity, pouncing on into the site and popping heads one at a time. It was a job well done from Kettering, and now Kent State, they need to make some changes. They need to change things up in a big way here to prevent that 7-2 decisive victory from Kettering here now at match point. Like you said, Vial, four rounds are needed in a row just to have a chance in overtime. I don't even know. I Well, first also, I want to say that the, the mirror, a mirror pick coming in for Kent State, this is something that we don't see often, mostly because mirror is banned. And this could prove to turn the tide at least for this round. But this map, at least, it looks like... Kettering just have their foot on the throat of Kent State and are not letting up anytime soon. And that could be a very dangerous flaw. Another big dangerous flaw is that they aren't putting anyone in this J bunker. That is, granted, it is going to be held by that mirror window. But I still don't know if I like that in terms of, you know, an overall take. Because they are going to scout this out, know that this wall is closed. And they just, all they have to do is get rid of that mirror window, which doesn't seem to be hard because Thatcher, once again, is on the board due to that Yana ban. So I, I don't know if I like this setup here coming in from Kent State. Well, bringing the Mira is a brilliant play. If Mira is on the board and you're heading to the basement of Oregon, you gotta play the Mira. It's an essential choice and it is a free amount of information and incredible challenge to actually get this Mira off the wall. As we can already see, it seems that Kettering are struggling to force IRX off this position. Of course, they're trying to remove that bandit battery and the hatch above being open will assist that process. Now, Derp and Bucca, having completed that top four clear and have opened up that hatch, they're looking to assist their team in pressuring down into J Bunker. Anomaly's gonna start opening up that supply room wall, but the Bandit will deny it, and Snappy himself will also get denied. A brilliant headshot delivered by Goose with the Vector. So now 4v5, Kettering finally on the back foot on their attack, and it will be further. Goose, a double kill, taking down the Habana, derps the next to fall, but the trade finally rings true, and Papa will find the head of Goose. Now a 3v4, the Nitro Cell takes Anomaly down to 2 HP, and now with the AK-12, he's gonna look for more, but Crusade will deny it. Now a 4v2, Kettering staring down a potential, their first round loss here on attack, as Kent State are hungry to find these last picks. Papa and Bucca, though, they are left in a 1v3 now. It's going to be Bucca, but it doesn't matter because Jax is going to net two on the round and shut this down. Kent State, they're not going to go down at least without a fight. 
Still, if, you know, Kettering does manage to pull off this next round, it would be a 7-3, which is still technically a decisive victory. And I think, at least from what we've watched, Jay-Z, Kettering have looked a little bit decisive, at least on this map. Yeah, the first time that their uh, decisiveness was dealt with by Kent State. They stopped it for at least one round, but can they stop it for the remainder of this map? Can they stop it three more rounds in a row? The tertiary bomb site will be where we answer that question. And last time we saw this site in play, we never actually got to see the bomb site actually played. It was all upstairs. The vertical play characterized the entire round. Nobody made it onto the first floor, at least from the attacking team. All the pressure was stopped at that top floor position. And so Kettering now on the attack, they know how to bomb. hold top floor on defense, but can they attack? the top floor when this vertical extension is going true. Of course, it's not essential to take vertical control. You could try to get a dining room plant as long as you get showers control early on and small tower control, but we're gonna have to see exactly what Kettering choose to bring. Now they are electing to bring the Mira as well. Once again, this operator played off dividends for them in the round before. And I, I hope, at least for the favor of Kent State, that it will again. Now, the only question is, where are you going to elect to place them? And it looks like one of them, Goose, is going to play them in that dining room site. And it makes a lot of sense. It gives you a lot of info in onto that. But the only question is, do you elect to put IRX, the bandit, on that wall once again? Because this is going to prove to be a very, very vital spot here for the attack. If they get this wall open and they get bathroom control, it could prove to be a very, very dangerous retake here for Kent State. But it looks like, at least as of right now, we want to go for a south and east side take for the attack. We're going to see Papa and Anomaly working their way in from the master side. The reinforcement coming out last minute on this master wall, but Papa not able to close off or at least find those shots. The wall will be reinforced, but Papa, 12 kills so far, looking to add to that total and find these upstairs defenders. That's going to be Jax, Snooki, and one more player hiding out in kids waiting for this push to come through but it will indeed as papa finds the headshot and here comes bucka to join their teammate on this push and papa will be doing all the work dealing with this top floor presence as derp will hop in the big window once again we did we saw that two rounds ago and now with that hard breach gadget will be opening up that hatch to get the pressure mounting onto the site. Now Goose has been completely forced out of that position and needs to be very careful of this vertical play. The shot's raining out from above and Goose is in a very tough position, hoping to get out of there alive, but that may be easier said than done. We'll do it, but now with the mirror window popped, Goose is going to have to hold this with their lives. Just under 90 seconds here left to go in Kettering. They just look to have the front foot and a foothold in this map. They just look to be a lot more dominant. And it's something that I was not expecting to come out. Because typically we see teams fight back whether it is when they lose their first map. And it's their map pick. So I'm very shocked right now to see Kettering for playing at least a lot better than we were expecting. Goose is down here. Papa finds himself the triple kill. He is on for 15 and he might he's looking hungry he wants this ace now with 50, 45 seconds left to go he knows that someone is going to beat this angle here and all they have to do is force their way down crusade finds bucka bucka finds irx so that's gonna deny the ace clutch at least for now and i won't even call it a clutch but crusade he has to finish this round out very soon and very quickly the only question is does he extend this map a little more now in a post plant scenario has no advantage whatsoever for his team and he's just might a look to waste some time. Well, with 30 seconds left on this diffuser, it's an impossible situation for the castle. It would be probably the best play in CR6 history if he were able to do that. And Derp will not allow it. The GG's in chat and Kettering will take the series in what seemed to be a very decisive fashion, especially on Oregon, letting the community know they're sending a message right now. They deserve to be ranked in those collegiate R6 rankings. They deserve to be up there, and Kent State deserves to be relegated down that list. They Both of these teams proved tonight 
that they absolutely have what it takes to compete at a high level of Siege, but Kettering proving that they compete a just a bit higher. Their strategies all across the board just seemed a bit more put together. It all seemed to click into position just a bit more for Kettering and Kent State. They were not able to make those on-the-fly adjustments that we saw Kettering do so well. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it comes down to adjustments because if a team is able to adjust, no matter what your strategy is or what a strategy is thrown at you, if you're able to adjust, you're going to be able to win the round because you're going to know what to do on the fly. You know what is going to be more available to you and what is going to be the best option. And speaking of best option, I think we have to give Papa that best option for MVP <laughs> through two maps. This man balled out. Give him 26 kills through two maps and i believe he was under double digits for deaths so i mean let's give him where he, where the credit is deserved i agree but you know these are the moments vial that i always shout out the support players out there because of course playing that entry that gunner role that roaming role you're gonna find those kills they just come into your arms but only if only if those support players play so well, they lock down that site, they anchor it down, and they don't let those attackers to get any quick play onto the site. So brilliant play from everyone on Kettering to enable that win. Everyone contributed a pretty damn good amount there to make that one happen. So shout out to all of those players for really putting on quite a performance. We're going to get an interview rolling out pretty soon. We're probably looking for, we're looking for Bucca here, and he is already here. Bucca Welcome to the booth. First of all, congratulations on that win. How are you feeling? Pretty good after map two. I mean, map one was a little dicey, but map two, we really cleaned it up. Going into Oregon, we knew it was our map, and uh, we know how to play it, and we know how to run it. Amazing. Well, Vial, take it away. So, I do have the first question I want to ask is that on that first map, it got very, very dicey, and you guys didn't seem to be very aware of the roamers that seem to just really pester you guys. Did you guys really think that there was something that you needed to worry about or were they just throwing a wrench for you guys? Um, it was kind of a wrench for us, but on our roam clears, we are pretty thorough. Although we didn't really have one going into that map one, but we started to warm up and we started to get rolling and it, it did start to help out towards the end when they went back to that master site and we had won that master site previously. And it's very hard to roam on that master site other than playing in like cash and CC. And I know Derp just dropped like a 3K or a 4K and just called it a day on that round. But I mean, it's what it takes right there is just someone to go in and click a couple of heads and that's the round. Makes sense. And going on to both maps, we actually noticed that you guys banned out Yana both maps. I believe, I believe it was you guys. So walk me through that. Is it, was that a target ban? Was that something that you guys regularly ban out? What's the, what's the thought process behind that? Well, uh, our very wonderful analyst, Lucas, was looking through VODs beforehand and was like, hey, wait a minute. These guys guys, these guys run quite a bit of Yana here. So if we, if we drop that into the mix, what happens to their attack? Because I know if you guys are aware of the Yana meta, you just throw the drone and you throw your fragger behind it and then shoot the Yana drone and then obviously fragger puts in work. But without that, what do they have to do to work around that? And uh, that pick, that band right there was very, very helpful in this win tonight. Yeah, it definitely seemed like the information game wasn't there, especially with that pick for them. I don't have any more questions. So, Jay-Z, anything you'd like to add? I mean, the only thing I'd like to ask is, you know, how are you feeling after that last one? Especially, especially because, you know, I think everyone in the community is aware that, that Kent State, they made it on to, you know, the Collegiate R6 rankings that uh, some great members in our community put together. And when presented with that, you were like, hey, why isn't Kettering up there? We deserve that spot. What do you have to say to those people now? Uh, I mean, truth in the truth in the scoreboards, right? I mean, you just got to look at the scoreboard to show what's up. I mean, Snail, Snail was really saying that the mathematics were going towards Kent State. But, I mean, strength of schedule comes into play. and I mean, that is not in their metrics, I don't think, at least. And we only had two less in round difference. And Snail was saying that Kent State's better than Kettering, blah, 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 and all this stuff. And uh, glad we put Snail in his place tonight. Yeah, you absolutely did. And you definitely answered the question of which team is better. Uh, and of course, this is the time where I'm going to pass the mic to you, my man. You have the opportunity to shout out your teammates, your supporters, anyone who you'd like. The mic is yours. 
Uh, I'd really like to support, uh, uh, give a shout out to my brother, JB, who's also a fellow caster here. I know he ca casted last night. I know he's out there watching right now. And uh, definitely a shout out to Lucas. Uh, without his help, we, we would not be where we are right now. I mean, his, his assistance alone makes us such a better team with strats and research and scouting. All that, all the work that he puts in really pays off at the end of the day when it comes down to us playing and us getting the frags to win those rounds. Awesome. Well, once again, congratulations on your victory. We look forward to seeing you go for a run in the open playoffs. Uh, wish you good, good luck, Rebecca. Thank you. I wish you guys good night. Good night. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. They put Snell in his place and they put Kent State in their place as well. That will do it for the first series of the night of this doubleheader, but we are not done yet. We've got UTSA versus Texas A&M coming up next, and that is going to be a showdown. That is a premier invite league match, the play-in for the round of 16 playoffs that will be happening next week. So it is a big deal. There is elimination on the line for one of these teams. So be sure to tune in for that. Grab a snack, grab some water, and get back here ready to go. We'll be back in just a bit. So stick with us, and we'll see you in a moment. Shadows in the atmosphere, charting the stratosphere. Yeah, yeah. I prayed for you and kept you near, and hopes you'd chase away my fears. I'm on my own, you made it so. Seem blaming you, you did not know Afraid to live this 
Bye.